forward as possible. So does anyone want to take up the challenge to pose a question or, or respond, make a comment on one of the uh, um, topics that were covered by another speaker? Um, a partnership with First Nations when it comes to renewable or clean energy. Um, it's everywhere. It's uh, at West Moray is involved in, we have a lot of wind projects. We're working on a solar, we belong to a solar, uh, the Solar City Initiative with the uh, city of Dawson Creek. And it's, it's, it's in our value system and traditional knowledge that we, we keep the environment and look after it because it looks after us. Why would we destroy water? Because we need it. And you know, the, this, the talk that David Suzuki did at Paddle for the Peace, he said, keep it a basic, and that's your answer. And that's what it is. We need the rules of nature and the value of nature for us to live, to sustain our life. Else have a comment, or should we open it up? Okay, let's uh, let's open it up. And uh, did you have a comment? Nope. Okay. <laughs> at, at the back there. Yeah, um, lots of good information. I'd just like to ask how you can realistic do you think it is to not continue? I heard the concept of suspensions, but I just, I mean, it's huge odds from my perspective. So I think they got it. You got it. <laughs> Uh, I'll answer quickly. If Christy Clark gets re-elected in May 9th, none. Uh, there is no possibility this will get cancelled. Uh, <coughs> draw your own conclusions. Okay. Yeah. Papa Sadani, Father of Sable Fish, Father of All Women, Raven Tribe, Yanada. Expressing appreciation for the acknowledgement. Thank you, Dr. Korea, for uh, covering off what uh, I was starting to worry might have been an uh, unacceptable, unacceptable oversight. Uh, also, expressing appreciation for the privilege of having been up there uh, in late August of 2015 and again uh, early July last year for Paddle the Peace. And uh, so, uh, my question is primarily directed to our respective elder who uh, is uh, distinguishing even more an already distinguished panel. Um, I believe that Treaty 8 involves uh, your area, some north of 60 in northwestern Alberta. kind of wonder how um, Treaty 8 components interact with each other and one specific reference, I think that when BC Hydro wanted to try to talk to your Indigenous colleagues in northwestern Alberta about this uh, this uh, pathetic project uh, that what the Indigenous people in northwestern Alberta said at that time to BC Hydro was you didn't talk to us about Site A, <laughs> you didn't talk to us about Site B, you want to talk to us about Site C, let's have those conversations first about, uh, about Site A and Site B, so if, if we could speak a bit Sir, if you so choose about interaction between various components in Treaty 8, thank you. Well, I'll be very honest uh, about the process. Um, downstream is, is a major effect because of hydrology and the complexity of, of uh, the Peace River. And when, it's down, when it was dammed up, it shortened actually the, the hydrology of, of And the same thing that would be like the Savannah, if you stop the flooding, then it affects the delta. The flooding stopped and it affected the delta. It devastated that whole ecosystem. Now, the last part of what exists in BC of the Peace River is even more, more complex because that is the most important part as we see it. It's the last part. But the interaction has been undermined by economic gain, economic plan for some nation. We started out with five nations going to court. There was only two left at the end. Our last decision on, on a court, we went to five or six court cases. The most devastating one was that last one. In, we went in September in Montreal in the Supreme Court. I can talk about that, but while well, we forbid. But to answer you, um, we do have a lot of support in Treaty 8, but it's not the total 100% support. Thank you. Do you have a comment, question? Yeah, oh, I, I talk loud. I just wanted to comment on oh. The uh, one thing you left off, Paul, in your last slide there, I, you may have mentioned it, but 
the, the uh, clean energy can be brought on in, in very small chunks, and it doesn't have to be brought on. With Site C, we're going to get whatever it is, 400 or so megawatts coming when it's completed, and that's it. It's done. We paid for it. We're stuck with it. But if we don't need that in in uh, in uh, 2020, we just don't build wind farms. I mean, it's it, and and they're going to be small, and when they can be built quickly and so on. Incremental build was incremental, part of the modeling that incremental that build is the, is the key. Okay. Yeah, certainly incremental build was, was part of the modeling that we did and explaining that load forecasts are variable and, for example, uh, LNG being so uncertain in that if you wanted to electrify. Can I make the, the comment, though, that, um, well, the load forecast has been flat from a, from a broader climate perspective in terms of electrifying how we live. We, we've got a big reach to get to, and electrification has got to figure more prominently, and so could that load forecast go up? It should go up. I agree, but if you look at the detailed modeling that was done of electrification and around decarbonization of the economy, predictions are that those demands would be modest until the 2030s. Right, with, DSM. And with DSM, we've got an enormous amount we could do with energy conservation. So <coughs> the ar argument along that line goes we get way more efficient while electrifying, therefore demand overall doesn't go up as fast, right. therefore the uh, incrementalist approach to building these smaller chunks right when you need them, which makes more economic sense, has lower overall environmental impacts, becomes very viable. But that's, that's, a, that's, um, that's not the, the view that was obviously taken when the decision was made. And um, there was a, an interesting debate about risk aversion that I think we could have, but let's move on to other questions. Councillor Doki, you wanted to add yeah. on to that? What people don't know is that we, in Northeast British Columbia, there is additional power already to be generated. And I talked to Karen about that briefly in Treaty 8 and again uh, today. I look after all the uh, agreements for uh, for West Mountain First Nation. I oversee every agreement in industry and every project that happens uh, with the team. But on-site visits, every oil and gas well site or facility has, there's 30,000 wells plus in Northeast British Columbia, over 100,000 kilometers of pipeline. And every one of those facilities, whether it be a pipeline company or uh, an oil and, uh, rig, they have a gas-fired power plant, two to three as backup, that produce four, uh, 500 to 750 kilowatts, over a megawatt in each one of those facilities. No one has taken inventory of that. But because of the Clean Energy Act being changed before Site C was approved, they can't sell that power back to the grid. Now, the reason why industry looks after itself very well, because they actually have the, the, the supply of gas, natural gas, right? Natural gas burns cleaner than gasoline that we have in our cars. And to us, that was the alternative. The Shepherd plant in um, Calgary takes 40 acres. It produces 900 megawatts, right, Paul? Almost as much as Site C. We, as Chief Roland has said before, our Chief of the Nation, said, we don't oppose uh, development or mega projects. We oppose destruction of certain areas and where they're built. And the valley is so precious that why would you destroy it when you can get the power from other means and other ways of doing it? You know, the gas fire power plants are already there, but they can't sell it back to hydro because of the Clean Energy Act. Okay, let's get some other comments. Yeah, um, all the speakers here had an argument of why Site C doesn't make sense. Anything you read in the media, whoever's writing it, says Site C doesn't make sense. I'm old enough to have been around in the 80s and remember hearing all these arguments then. Yet a political decision was made to go ahead with it. So it's impossible for the public to understand what was the advantage Makes no sense. Like I, I just, I don't get it. I can't imagine what's the basis of a decision like that. What is the advantage? Who, who, who's the advantage? Like, it, it makes no sense. So why? Are we <laughs> <laughs> try construction companies. Yeah. Um, try calling it a vanity project for somebody to put a name on a dam. 
um, there there are people in hydro who think that their longevity will be dependent on dams forever. Um, I don't agree with them, and I have a, as hard a time as you do understanding what's driving this thing. But pick those three. Um, well, if you look at the history, as I was told you, I, my first project, my father pulled me into the office, was Site C in 1981. It was already in the making. It got declined. Again in 1984, it got declined. So this is a, a history of a project that's been declined, and yet it's going through. You said something about vanity. There's something about human nature, and perhaps please don't get this all wrong. I say this in a very spiritual way, from our, our traditional way. Vanity becomes insanity. Human nature can be that. Can I just make... Oh. Yeah. I, I just want to make one brief comment. Um, you know, there's, there's really two kinds of uh, 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 assessments that, that take place that provide a discipline. Uh, over governments. One is to have uh, good internal assessments taking place. Uh, that has broken down in the BC government over the last few years for a whole number of areas. So we've lost that capacity to, to, to do the internal hard-nosed assessment to at least give the government good advice. We should worry about that. But people don't. I mean, that's a complicated question, and a lot of, not very many people are going to recognize that. The other is, you know, put political discipline. And we're not experts on why there is why there's so little political recognition that this is being done because the rhetoric of the economy has been successful. And th that's something we have to recognize. By claiming big projects with big job creation numbers, which we see are not long-term jobs, by owning the, the economic agenda, it, it, they, they own the political agenda. And I think all of us have to ask ourselves some questions about that, how we engage in this debate and what we do about this. I remember just one comment. I, I think the last major hydro project it was planned in Canada and did not proceed it was on the Churchill River in northern Saskatchewan. And I remember so clearly the government of the day was so convinced they were going to do this because they wanted political credit. And when the government changed, it was cancelled, and there's been, no one has ever talked again about building a dam on the Churchill River. You can change the dynamics that simply, but it has to be done through using the tools we have to uh, change the government's mind. Okay, back here. I was wondering if you could give us an update on the legal um, cases happening, and my worry is that the legal um, conflicts or battles will be too slow in, in terms of what's going on uh, on the ground. Um, and I guess the other question I had around the economy was, you mentioned that um, 30 farming families will be expropriated, and that I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the economics of the agricultural land and the family there. And, and that might be a way of thinking about what we're losing as well as what could be gained if we protected it. Um, well, as I said, we've had about, we have six court cases on the straight seat just in the last while. Our chief couldn't make it here today because he's so tired. He goes, he's away three weeks out of a month. He sees family one week, roughly. And I'm here on his behalf of my nation. But on the court case, the most devastating one is the last one we had, Supreme Court. We went to Montreal um, because it was, it was more, the sooner we can get to, to try and stop the process. Um, there was a documentary that was done by APTN shortly before that court case in August. And in there, we said that this project will affect every treaty. And the reason why we said that was it was the manner that it was done the BC Utilities Commission was left out. There was not an appropriate uh, consultation process, even with the joint review panel in saying what they said in, in their review. Uh, then, of course, the federal government released all the water permits based on the fact that they were looking at the infringement of the, of the treaty rights by taking up the land and flooding it and, and all that stuff, and the cumulative impact of Treaty 8. At the end of it all, what happened was that we thought we had a fairly good, you know, case. Because infringement, who answers that? Is it the minister or is it the government, federal government, who we have an agreement with on your treaty, constitutionally, constitutionally protected? Our faith was that. And at the end of it all, it now becomes that it would, we would have to have a civil case 
in order for us to go that route. It's like saying, you know what, we're going to give you, here's an analogy, we get five dollars a year for being treaty. That has not gone up since 1914, it's still the same five dollars. They kept their promise, they just didn't raise it. But, what the court is now saying, you get your five dollars, but now we're going to make it 250. That's how much it's affected the treaties in all of Canada, in my opinion. And that's just my opinion. And again, media, don't change it on me, please. Because it's my opinion of where I'm at. I made the comment on APTN on a, on a documentary that went national. I said, it will affect every treaty. And it did. It was the way it was done, and it was the way how it was handled by not having the proper processes in place. That is the duty of both governments. And at the end of it all, the courts did not answer about infringement. Okay. I'd like to add to that. Um, we've abused First Nations for 200 years. Most of us here are settlers. We're not First Nations. Um, and to fight those cases, the Delgamo case, the Chilco case, and all the cases brought by Chief Wilson, etc., um, they've had to reach into their health care funds, into their education funds, into funds that the scarce funds that these bands do have to fight uh, these cases. And I think that's iniquitous. And if I may also add, so Dr. Gordon Christie from UBC Law isn't here, but he's written extensively about this. And I, I think a couple of key points are the imbalance that currently exists because of these recent court cases that you explained. The, um, the inequity is obvious. The Crown can proceed as it wishes with no consultation on infringement of treaty rights. In order to um, force the Crown to consider an infringement of treaty rights, the affected nations are required to take the Crown to court in lengthy, costly court proceedings that are likely going to complete after the project is built. So it's a build now, litigate during, compensate after approach that is makes a mockery of the government's commitment to reconciliation with First Nations. So that's why we also recommended in our reports and in the public um, the media articles that during suspension, the Department of Justice, federal, be mandated to examine the question of infringement of treaty rights. That should go hand in hand with the BC Utilities Commission review and the Federal Department of Justice was remiss in our opinion in not taking that opportunity. Thank you, Rafana. Can I just make one brief comment as well? Uh, this is the area I've worked in a lot. And, and one of the things I think everybody should realize is that every one of these court cases that are known and famous for having extended some uh, uh, protections to First Nations. Every one of them creates a license as well for government to infringe. It is a test of the of the arrogance of our governments that they are not. They do, they go ahead without pro proceeding in the way that they they they, they 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 could proceed successfully if they turned their mind to it and proceeded. But I, I don't think we should be too excited about relying on <coughs> the law, the the court cases that have provided for protection of First Nations to stop these kind of projects. The governments want to do them, they're going to do them, and every one of these cases they can go back and redo the infringement process and they'll be successful. Okay, other comments? Uh, you, were, you had your hand up for a while.